let me show you how you can tell, first of all, how you can tell a person this is the chosen generation for sure. And that is found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 37. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. First of all, I want you to look at the picture above this article. It says, post, state of Israel is born. Israel was born in 1948. They were not a nation for almost 2,000 years. And then all of a sudden, on May 14th of 1948, they became a nation again for a second time. They are considered the fig tree. You can also see this in the Old Testament. For example, Hosea chapter 9 verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers at the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. When his branch is yet tender, in other words, when Israel, the reborn nation, is still young, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And all of the things that Jesus Christ is referring to is found in Matthew chapter 24, the birth pain signs of the last days, all of them in one single generation. Let's go on. Verily I say unto you, now get this, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to the generation who saw the rebirth of the nation of Israel, that fig tree that he talked about. That places you in a special generation, the generation that will not pass away until we see Jesus Christ return. You should plant verse 34 in your mind, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. No mistaking about it, we are that generation. So in teaching about the coming third Jewish temple, we have to connect the prophecy from Zechariah because they go hand in hand. And Zechariah told us in chapter 12 of Zechariah, verses 2 and 3, he told us the following, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make, notice, Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So the city of Jerusalem and this holy place on the Temple Mount will be the poster boy for major troubles for people around the world. Now, to begin with, I want to focus in on Israel today. Jerusalem, a cup of trembling and a burdensome stone. Their headline is almost identical to the prophecy that Zechariah gave to us. And this was November the 23rd of 2010. Now in their report, they quote Zechariah, which I've already given to you, so I'm not going to repeat that. But it does go on to say, the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12 was written approximately 2,500 years ago, predicting a future day when the world's focus would be on Jerusalem. And that's what I'm going to show you, that that day has already come. I'm going to highlight the most important parts of this article. Begin here. This is widely regarded as an end time prophecy and by examining the current geopolitical and spiritual situation of the Middle East conflict, it is safe to say the time frame of this prophecy is upon us and they're definitely right. Today, millions of Jewish people have returned and many are still making Aliyah as prophesied in the Bible. And there is a prophecy in the Old Testament that just before Jesus Christ comes back, that the people, the Jews who've been dispersed, are making Aliyah, which means they're coming back from the east, the south, the north, and the west. They've already done this and they're still coming back. 
The call of the world at this time, then, is the attempt to lift this immovable rock, but in return to only find that the word of God is the unshakable truth. So let's examine the proof of what's happened since this article came out from November 23rd of 2010. And you will see that the birth pangs that Jesus Christ talked about are ratcheting it up when it comes to the burdensome stone of Jerusalem and of course connected to the third temple that will be built. Now here are just a few of the many many articles showing us that what Zechariah prophesied is coming true in our generation. The headline survey the whole world is against us. This is how the Israelis are viewing what's happening to Israel as all the nations are lining up to come against Israel and, of course, Jerusalem. Here's how the world turned against Israel. That came out December the 2nd of 2014. Here's another one from February the 5th of 2015. UN condemns Israel, ignores Hezbollah. The situation in Jerusalem, where the Temple Mount is, has intensified since 2010, as you see in this article that came out in July 16th of 2017, why dividing Jerusalem in a peace deal just got harder. Israeli ministers approved a bill that would make it difficult to divide, there you go, Jerusalem in a peace deal. Now look at this. We will prevent a situation like in 2000 when Ehud Barak wanted to hand over the, look at this, Temple Mount and three quarters of the old city, the Mount of Olives and the city of David to Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat at the Camp David Talks, Bennett said in a Facebook post. Now keep in mind what Zechariah the prophet told us. He says, though all the people of the earth will be gathered against it. That also includes the United States. If he says all the people, it would have to definitely include the United States. And for those of us watching Bible prophecy, the year 2015 when President Barack Obama was elected, you see from this article, Team Obama has thrown Israel to the diplomatic wolves. And during that time, Obama was saying Israel is on her own. So we saw a dramatic change from being very friendly with Israel to throwing Israel under the bus. Since Donald Trump took office. He has restored the relationship between Israel and the United States where Barack Obama was disintegrating that relationship. A poll that was released in the Times of Israel March 6th of 2019. Look at the headline. New poll. American support for Israel declines to lowest point in a decade. So even though the president is a staunch friend of Israel, we see the numbers of support for Israel declining. Footsteps to the prophecy being fulfilled entirely in the near future. And as the years go by, we see that the world continually comes against Israel. Look at this article, December 7th of 2018, the Middle East Monitor. The world condemns Israel. One of the main issues right now is the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And most of the world now is taking a position with the Palestinians. But it goes even deeper than that because it goes to the issue of sovereignty, as I've been discussing. Look at what the report said. We'll start it here. The most important resolution is related to Jerusalem, and it rejects Israel's sovereignty over the holy city by 148 votes to 11 with 14 abstentions. Now, the resolutions that they're talking about are resolutions by the United Nations against Israel. Israel. How is the whole world coming against Israel? Let's go back to this UN watch to show you these resolutions that are being passed against Israel. In the current 73rd session of the UN General Assembly, 2018 through 2019, all EU member states voted for one resolution each to criticize number one, Iran, number two, Syria, number three, North Korea, number four, Crimea, number five, Miramar, and six, the U.S. for its embargo on Cuba. By contrast, EU states voted for 16 out of the 21 resolutions singling out Israel. 
yet these same EU states fail to introduce a single UNGA resolution on the human rights situation in China, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Belarus, Cuba, Turkey, Pakistan, Vietnam, Algeria, or on 175 other countries. Now, over the years, the UN has sanctioned the Israelis because they're claiming sovereignty of East Jerusalem, and this is where the Temple Mount is. So the connection between Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, very significant in a chosen generation. This is a new article, March 6th, 2019, from TV7 Israel News. Battle, now get this, over sovereignty of Jerusalem's Temple Mount intensifies. Signals that the birth pangs are getting much more intense and it's focused on the exact place where the Lord prophesied where the focus would be for years. Israel as a nation has been fighting for their sovereignty which they own already but the UN wants to take it away. Sovereignty over the city of Jerusalem. Sovereignty of East Jerusalem where that temple is going to be built in East Jerusalem. Take a look at this article that came out from the Jerusalem Post June 27th of 2017. Israel gears up for Jerusalem sovereignty fight in UNESCO. Israel's pushing to sway the 21 nations on UNESCO's World Heritage Committee to reject a resolution disavowing Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. This short video will explain what exactly UNESCO is and why it is that the United States has pulled out of UNESCO. This is pulling out of UNESCO. The State Department notified UNESCO Director General Irina Bakova of the decision Thursday. UNESCO is a specialized agency in the United Nations that encourages international peace and security through education, science, culture, and communication. Now I'm going to play this back just for a second because this also connects to another prophecy. Listen to what she said again about peace and safety. Encourages international peace and security. Paul warned that this was going to happen in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And as Israel calls for peace and safety, and as the world is calling for peace and safety, the main problem that the world, United Nations, UNESCO is focusing on is Israel and their occupation of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And they're saying this is the cause for the lack of peace and safety. So let's continue on with the video explaining what UNESCO is all about. It's best known for its World Heritage List. The State Department says its decision came down to debts and the need for reform in the agency. The department also voiced concerns about an anti-Israel bias at UNESCO. She said the U.S. pulling out is a loss for the U.N. and for international alliances. The latest withdrawal takes effect at December 31st, 2018. Now, going along with the problem with Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, the birth pangs of people coming against Israel are growing. The cases of anti-Semitic acts against the Jews have increased. Signs of those birth pains. For example, let's take 2016, the Jerusalem Post. Anti-Semitism in UK highest since period following 2009 Gaza conflict. Anti-Semitism across the UK rose by 11% in the first half of 2016 in comparison with the same period of 2015, according to a report published Thursday by the Community Security Trust CST. The organization recorded 557 anti-Semitic incidences in the first six months of this year in contrast with 500 last year you could see the increase the signs of those birth pangs and it's getting worse look we are all aware of the rise in incidents of hatred and violence against immigrants and more generally minorities in the last year but a striking statistic makes one aware that this is an even larger problem than we realize the number of anti-Semitic incidents in the United States surged in 2017, increasing by 57%, according to a new report by the Anti-Defamation League. You might have thought that Jews in America could live safely and securely 
fully assimilated and integrated into the country to which they have contributed so much. But last year, America had its second highest number of reported incidents of harassment, vandalism, or assaults against Jews or Jewish institutions since records began in 1979 with nearly 2,000 such incidents. The ADL says it was the largest single year increase on record. So this report ended with 2017. The increases over the years, and you can see just like a woman in labor where the pains decrease and then they ratchet up until the baby is born. That's what Jesus shows us, just like a woman travail with birth pains. Let's turn now to 2018. You'll see this trend around the world is continuing. The Times of Israel, their report was filed on January the 27th, 2019. Headline, 2018 was deadliest year for anti-Semitic violence since 1994 Israeli report. The Diaspora Affairs Ministry on Sunday released a report on global anti-Semitism showing a worldwide increase in attacks against Jews and Jewish targets last year and the highest number of fatalities in anti-Semitic attacks around the world in 25 years. No question, we're in the midst of the birth pangs to fulfill all the rest of the prophecies. On July 19th of 2017, amazing development took place. And it centers really around the sovereignty of the Temple Mount. Who really owns and runs the Temple Mount? In an article entitled, Temple Mount Reopens to Jewish Visitors After Temporary Closure, M.K. Brazel Smodrick. Bayat Yodi criticized the police move and said that in these times strength is being measured. This is an outrageous move of collective punishment that is providing a tailwind to terrorism, said Smodrick. The Guaf people and Israeli Arabs decided to open a wave of riots because of the installation of metal scanners and now they are closing Temple Mount because of some mumbling of prayer quotes. Smodrick then called on Halivi to retract his move. Our next steps will be our sovereignty test here. We should not repeat our past mistakes. Deputy Foreign Minister Terpizi Hordovli called the move a mistake and reiterated the call to open the site for Jews. There are days in which we should strengthen our sovereignty in the Temple Mount and make it clear that we are not intimidated by threats. So over the years, if you've been watching my videos, I've been telling you, you're going to have people that go into the Knesset these MKs that are going to be pushing for full access on the Temple Mount for the Jews. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. But there's more. Now, the question many of you may be asking, why do they even have to strengthen their sovereignty? And the answer to that would be because they gave their sovereignty away just about in 1967. This is a picture of Moshe Dayan. And Moshe Dayan was a general who was really running the Israeli army and uh, he was really responsible for the victory of 1967, the war when the Arabs attacked Israel. And it was at that time that Israel recaptured Jerusalem. They hadn't had it in their hands for almost 2,000 years. And in 1967, because of that war, it was the first time in almost 2,000 years that the Jews actually owned, again, the Temple Mount in East Jerusalem. So what happened, as you can see from this article that I just pulled up for you, the status quo was created at the end of 1967 war, when Moshe Dayan gave the Arabs administrative powers to conduct prayers in the al Asq Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. The Jews, Dayan envisaged, would suffice with the Western Wall. So one may think that after almost 2,000 years that they finally got Jerusalem back in their hands, why would Moshe Dayan allow the Arabs administrative powers to conduct prayers at the al Asq Mosque? And ever since 1967, nothing has changed up until recently where the status quo is now being questioned. And I personally believe that the birth pangs that Jesus talked about are starting to really ratch up. 
and this area is, as I said, a time bomb waiting to go off. So now Israel is trying to make establishment of sovereignty on that Temple Mount. They're going to have to, one way or another, because the prophecy tells us that the Jews are going to go up and they're going to sacrifice in the Temple. So that means they're going to somehow get access, full access, to the Temple Mount. That's why this question about sovereignty on the Temple Mount is critical, especially in relation to prophecy and what's going to happen in the near future. The news from One for Israel gives information how miraculous it was for the Jews after almost 2,000 years without having sovereignty of either Jerusalem or East Jerusalem, how the prophecy came true in 1967. They cite the prophecy. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. A time was coming, he tells us, when the city would once again be in the hands of the Jewish people. I doubt those listening to him at the time could have possibly imagined how many years would pass before the prophecy came true. For the first time in over two millennia since before the Roman conquest, Israel regained control of Jerusalem 50 years ago last year. As controversial as, as the 1967 Six-Day War still is with all the subsequent fallout, the sheer number of coincidences that happen show that these events have God's fingerprints all over them. Many miracles were reported over the duration of those six days, which led to a highly improbable victory, a repeating theme in the history of both modern and ancient Israel. Yeshia's words were coming to pass. A TV7 Israel News, published March the 6th of 2019, will give you the information as far as who is controlling the Temple Mount area and how that happened. But the main point I want you to see in this video is they're talking about Jerusalem's sovereignty on that Temple Mount area. Watch this. The battle of sovereignty over Jerusalem's Temple Mount has intensified in recent weeks with the Islamic Waqf that oversees the ancient site actively contesting Israeli instructions on matters of security and access. The Waqf, which maintains control over the ancient compound that houses the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, on lands where both biblical temples once stood, has governed the access to the mount since the Muslim conquest of the Kingdom of Jerusalem in 1187. That said, despite the fact that Israel reclaimed the old city of Jerusalem during the Six-Day War of June 1967, which subsequently led to its decision to assert sovereignty over all parts of the city. Wary of greater conflicts with the Muslim world, the leadership of the Jewish state at the time allowed the Islamic Waqf to retain administrative authority over the Temple Mount as part of the known diplomatic arrangement, status quo antedelum, Latin, for the state of the affairs that existed before the war. For the sake of peace, Moshe Dayan, which I already explained who he was, as it said in this video, he allowed the Waf, the people from Jordan, to maintain the control of the Temple Mount. That was the biggest mistake Moshe Dayan made after taking back the city of Jerusalem and that Temple Mount area. Let's continue. That is why, to date, only Muslims are allowed to worship on the site, holy to the three monotheistic religions, with penalty of eviction and even incarceration to any non-Muslims who dare to practice their faith on the grounds. The battle of sovereignty over Jerusalem's Temple Mount had instigated multiple deadly waves of Palestinian hostilities against Israelis, including the two most major violent eruptions, known as the Second Intifada between the years 2000 and 2005, and the so-called Lone Wolf Intifada between 2015 and 2016. While the latter spate of violence subsided, tensions over the question of sovereignty continues to be at the heart of the decades-old Israeli air conflict. The latest tension pertains to a dispute between the Islamic Waqf and Israeli police 
over a walled courtyard in the northeastern part of the Temple Mount, which houses a hall that provides access to the only eastern gates of the ancient compound, commonly known as the Golden Gates. In 2003, at the height of the Second Intifada, Israeli authorities decided to seal off the structure after a police investigation revealed that a group with ties to the Islamist Hamas organization was effectively controlling the whole, teaching radical ideology of violence against non-Muslims. In recent weeks, however, the Islamic Waqf has challenged a closure, convening and staging prayer protests in the area. Despite a repeated court order to close the site, however, the Waqf Council, which is appointed by the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, has vowed to keep the courtyard open, leading to the arrest of two senior Islamic clerics by Israeli police. The more, and in spite of the fact that the Islamic cleric rejected any jurisdiction of Israeli courts on the Temple Mount, he demanded that Israel permit the Waqf to renovate the ancient building and revoke orders banning dozens of Waqf officials, guards and worshippers from the northeastern courtyard. It is important to know that according to Jewish tradition, the ancient Golden Gate is the entry point from which the Messiah is believed to enter Jerusalem. That is why, according to historic records, the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, sealed off the Golden Gate in 1541 and built a cemetery in front of it to prevent any false messiah, or antichrist for that matter, from coming through the gate into the Temple Mount. I want to make this perfectly clear, in case you didn't understand the significance of what this reporter had to say about this East Gate. Here is this East Gate also known as the Golden Gate, where the writing were taking place, obviously, on the other side of this gate. Now, you might be asking, what is one of the reasons why the Palestinians want to take over this area, this East Gate or Golden Gate area? Take a look at this prophecy from Ezekiel 44, 1 through 3. It says this, Then the man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be open. No man may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. Now, when did he ever enter through that? Well, Jesus Christ did enter through this east gate when he first came here. It goes on. The prince himself is the only one who may sit inside the gateway to eat in the presence of the Lord. He is to enter by way of the portico of the gateway and go out the same way. So a prophecy shows us that the Messiah, when he comes back, is going to be going through the East Gate. This is the East Gate. So many believe that one of the reasons why the Palestinians are rioting is because there's been a lot of talk about the Messiah coming soon. And obviously the Muslims don't want that to happen. So one of the ways to try to prevent that is to occupy the East Gate that he would be walking through. But everybody should realize there's nothing going to stop this prophecy from taking place. Jesus Christ will walk through this gate that's been blocked up since the 7th century. Century. If you have any questions that Israel is moving towards this sovereignty over the Temple Mount, take a look at this. This is from Arach Shiva, July 18, 2017. Dichner, Waf sovereignty and Temple Mount ended Friday. Chairman Eva Dichner of the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee said on Tuesday, Israel is sovereign on the Temple Mount, period. The fact that the Guaf Muslim Authority became a sovereign on the Temple Mount ended last Friday. Interviewed by Israeli Public Radio, the former head of the Shabak, Israel Security Agency, said, With regard to the Temple Mount, it can be said that this is a question of policy regarding the site, which is not clear to the Palestinian side, but it is very clear to us. In the past, they tried the al Ask is in danger campaign, and now they have moved to a new campaign that says the Temple Mount is equal to al Ask. They're trying to make it a problem for Jews to go up to the Temple Mount. The al Ask Mosque is defined as the third holiest place in Islam, and just as no non-Muslims can enter Mecca and Medina, they want to do the same on the Temple Mount. But the Mount will be under the control of the Israel police. So 
what happens here, the more violence that the Muslims create on that Temple Mount to try to keep the Jews away and more Jews being harmed, the faster the complete sovereignty is going to be exposed. In other words, the violence will get so bad on the Temple Mount that Israel already has a nation, sovereignty over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. But the increased violence by the Waf and the Muslims on the Temple Mount will force that much faster the complete sovereignty of East Jerusalem where the Temple Mount is. And that would definitely speed up access for the Jews to pray and build that third temple that was prophesied. Before Donald Trump became the President of the United States, he made a speech talking about how he was going to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Then after Donald Trump was elected, Vice President Pence also made a speech telling us the plans of Donald Trump where he promised he was going to move that embassy to Jerusalem. Watch these two videos and then you'll see the video as a reaction to the move of the embassy to Jerusalem as the Muslims call for war if it happens. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. And I promise you that the day will come when President Donald Trump moves the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This is a long overdue step to advance the peace process. Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Kita mengutuk keras pernyataan Presiden Trump atas klaim sepihaknya terhadap status tanah Yerusalem. Itu bagi kami merupakan sebuah pelanggaran berat. Sebuah pelanggaran berat, sebuah pelanggaran terhadap hak asasi manusia. Yang secara tidak langsung juga bagi kami itu telah merenggut hak-hak kemerdekaan Palestina. Hak-hak kemerdekaan warga Palestina atas kedaulatan mereka di tanah mereka sendiri. And of course, the New York Times shows how Donald Trump fulfilled his promise. Jerusalem Embassy is a victory for Trump and a complication for the Middle East peace. On May 14th, 2018, Donald Trump announced the move of the Embassy of the United States in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And it's on a special date, May 14th, 1948 is the day that Israel became a nation again, and that's the date that Donald Trump chose to move the embassy. Now, on that date of May 14th of 2018, the Prime Minister of Israel had a celebration concerning the U.S. Embassy moving to Jerusalem. It's very interesting in his speech how he notes the rebuilding of the different temples in the past. I believe he's alluding to the new one that is coming, and that's the one that Christ prophesied would come. Watch this. Thank you all. And of course, I want to especially welcome Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump. Your presence here today is a, a testament to the importance of this occasion 
not only for the Trump administration, but in a very personal way for you. For you, each of you, for the pursuit of peace, and for President Trump himself. Thank you. Dear friends, what a glorious day. Remember this moment. This is history. President Trump, by recognizing history, you have made history. So for me, this spot brings back personal memories but for our people, it evokes profound collective memories of the greatest moments we have known on this city on a hill. In Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, Abram passed the greatest test of faith and the right to be the father of our nation. In Jerusalem, King David established our capital 3,000 years ago. In Jerusalem, King Solomon built our temple, built our temple built our temple, which stood for many centuries. In Jerusalem, Jewish exiles from Babylon rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the temple, which stood for many more centuries. In Jerusalem, the Maccabees rededicated that temple, rededicated that temple, and restored Jewish sovereignty in this land. And it was here in Jerusalem, some 2,000 years later, that the soldiers of Israel spoke three immortal words, Hal Habayt Biadenu. The Temple Mount is in our hands. The Temple Mount is in our hands, is in our hands. Words that lifted the spirit of the entire nation. We are in Jerusalem and we are here to stay. Jerusalem, a cup of trembling. Perhaps you have seen Jerusalem in the news lately. If not, you're one of the very few. In the past few years, attempt after attempt has been made to find a way to bring peace to the Middle East, specifically between Israel and the Palestinians. Each time the peace talks have come to a standstill because of Jerusalem exactly as the prophets of God foretold 2,500 years ago. Jerusalem has become a cup of trembling and a burdensome stone, just as predicted. Everyone is afraid to mess with Jerusalem, and everyone who has tried has failed. Here is a city with no natural resources, no harbor, no river, no reason to have any strategic significance. It no longer controls any trade routes, or has any apparent reason for geopolitical strategic relevance. It wouldn't seem that important culturally. Only a relatively small portion of Jewish people regard it as significant. Even if all Jews were concerned, it still would not be enough of a worldwide focus for all the people of the earth to be gathered together against it. The Muslims controlled it for a thousand years, and they let it crumble into rubble until they discovered it was significant to the Jews, then, of course, it became critical to Islam. Christians regard it for historical and biblical reasons, but not to die for. And yet the late lights are burning tonight in every headquarters of every capital of every nation that has international relevance, and their leaders are struggling with what to do about the issue of Jerusalem. This next section from that video sums it up best, the problem of Jerusalem. President Clinton said the Camp David talks failed because of the two sides' refusal to compromise over Jerusalem. Jerusalem was founded by King David. God gave title deed to Jerusalem to only one people, the Jews. Jerusalem is the only city with a place in eternity. The Arabs say Jerusalem is their holy city, despite the shabby treatment it historically received at their hands and the lack of support for that designation in the Quran. By the mid-19th century, the city was a neglected backwater where Jews were in the majority. Israel refuses to divide the city, claiming it will remain their eternal 
undivided capital forever. It will take someone with the wisdom of Solomon to get these two sides to agree on anything where Jerusalem is concerned. God owns Jerusalem. The only city God claims as his own. To sum it up, this is what the Jew believes is at stake here. Jerusalem is part of being a Jew, and part of being a Jew is Jerusalem. Without one, the other cannot exist. So, with all of these facts, you can see what the problem is. And this question was asked in a video called The Coming Temple. Here's his explanation for that answer. After the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, the Jews never rebuilt a third temple during all those years. But why? I'm joined by Robert Mandelbaum, who's an eschatologist and Bible researcher. Robert, why was this? Why have the Jews never rebuilt their temple? Well, thanks for having me, Chris. It's great to be here. After 70 AD, the Jews were scattered throughout all of the world, and there came a time when Jews were not even allowed to live or visit Jerusalem. They wanted, of course, to rebuild their temple, and thanks to the Temple Institute, which is just behind us, all the plans are already made. The uh, sacrificial altar has been recently constructed. The priest robes have been made. Pretty much everything is ready to go. Robert, help us understand why is it so important to the Jewish religion to rebuild their temple? What is the significance of the temple to them? Well, Chris, there's many important reasons, but the primary reason, the number one reason, is the Jewish people do not believe their Messiah will arrive until that temple is rebuilt. So what's the problem? With everything set and ready to go, what's to stop the third temple being built? Well, the problem is that building you see over there above the Western Wall. It's called the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock was built by the Arab Caliph Abd al-Malik in 691 AD. It stands on what is known as the Temple Mount on the Haram al-Sharif. Ever since 1967, when the Jews reclaimed East Jerusalem in this area, this area has been huge problems for the world, as you've already seen. In any attempts by the Jews to go up to this area, all hell breaks out. And I believe that the birth pangs of all these riots and Israel calling for the same privileges on this temple area here, where the Dome of the Rock is, is leading to a major conflict that will cause the Third Temple to be built. Just recently, we saw the riots and the tensions and the conflict and the murders over this area again. Take a look at this. Here's one that I want to show you before we move on. From the Jerusalem Post, January the 3rd of 2017. Bloodshed will follow if Trump moves U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. So without a question, Israel, and specifically what takes place in Jerusalem, is constantly in the news and constantly nations are coming against this tiny nation. The connection to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount go hand in hand. And in 2017, we're seeing the flames of hatred over this small area on the Temple Mount. July 24th, 2017. Radical Claire calls for Islamic war for Jerusalem. And why do you think he's doing this? Take a look. 
confrontation with Israel on the Temple Mount should be defined as a religious campaign. Then we have this article that came out from Breaking Israel News, July 24th of 2017. This is a battle for Temple Mount Jerusalem security minister. And once again, as you've seen through this whole presentation, it's a matter of sovereignty. Israel will not back down on security measures for worshippers entering in the Temple Mount compound. Zachi Hanabi, Minister of National Security and Foreign Affairs, told Army Radio on Sunday. Israel, Hanabi said, is the sovereign power in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount. So over and over again in the news, we're seeing the same news with the same problem of Israel, Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, and the Muslims. And then finally, Israel March demanding access to Temple Mount and building of Third Temple. This was August the 1st, 2017 from Israel Today. The Jews have a feeling in 2017 they're getting much closer to actually rebuilding that temple. And thousands of Jews came out to march around the city, East Jerusalem, a show of force to their government that this is what they want done. Now I covered that prophecy about Zechariah and Jerusalem. Now we're going to get to the second part that I wanted to cover. Very, very important. And it all ties together. The prophecy about the rebuilt Jewish temple. There are many places in the Bible where it's referenced about this prophecy. And here's one in Daniel 9.27, for example. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Of course, this scripture is talking about the Antichrist who will not make a covenant, but he will only confirm a covenant that was apparently established previously. It goes on, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So in the middle of the seven-year period of time, three and a half years into this agreeing or confirming this covenant, the Antichrist is going to actually stop the sacrifices that have been prophesied that will be coming back in our generation. Now there's another prophecy that Jesus Christ gave to us in Matthew chapter 24 verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now moving on to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul the Apostle writes to us about the Antichrist. And he says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in, now get this, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the temple has to be rebuilt. The Antichrist is going to come and he is going to walk physically into that prophesied third temple that, that will be built soon. And we're coming to the last scripture that I want to use from Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. This is from Jesus Christ now who gave it to the youngest apostle, the apostle John. And he says this, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God. So we know exactly what he's measuring, the temple. And in order to measure it, it has to exist. Let's go on. And the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they trod underfoot forty and two months. Now with this prophecy, there are many prophecy teachers who believe that the outer court, where we see here from where the Dome of the Rock is, that when God told him not to measure that area, that he was really showing us that the third temple could be built next to this Dome of the Rock area. And that is a possibility because if there was something that was confirmed, this peace agreement that was confirmed, maybe part of that confirmation would be that both of these people, the Jews and the Muslims, would find a way under a covenant 
to exist together and having both the Dome of the Rock for the Islam faith and the Jewish temple for the Jewish faith. It is a possibility. So now that you see all of the prophecies, let me show you that God is working to fulfill these very words and he's doing it so through the Israeli government. And the Temple Institute there in Jerusalem. My friends, this third temple is definitely going to come. And here's the proof the road is being set. Take a look at this Jerusalem Post. This article came out March 29th, 2016 with the headline, High Speed Train from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv to be completed by 2018. The highly anticipated high-speed train that will connect Jerusalem to Tel Aviv in under 30 minutes will be operational in 2018, the head of Israel Railways announced on Monday. During a tour with the Knesset members at construction site for the NIS 1.82 billion project, Boaz Tafir, CEO of the railway, said the train will take passengers from Jerusalem International Convention Center in Tel Aviv's Haganah station in 28 minutes flat. Now one may ask, what is the connection between this high-speed train, Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount? This article becomes very significant when you're talking about transporting millions of people to an area that is currently being closed off to the Jews. And it becomes very significant when you find out that the Israeli government is spending massive amounts of money like this $1.82 billion. And plans that are being set to mass move millions of people right there at the Temple Mount. It's currently, as I said, closed off to the Jews. Now, it took a long time, but as you can see from the September 25th Rutgers report, Israel opens high-speed rail link between Tel Aviv Airport and Jerusalem. So the project is finished. This massive $2 billion project is now running between Tel Aviv and right to Jerusalem for the Temple Mount. So now let me connect the dots for you between this high-speed train, Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount. And of course, in the moving of millions of Jews to that area. Take a look at this next article. Breaking Israel News. Infrastructure to bring millions of pilgrims to Temple Mount quietly being constructed for the first time in approximately 2,000 years since the time of the Second Temple, plans are being formed by, guess who? The Israeli government to build an effective infrastructure for Jews to make their obligatory pilgrimage to the Temple in Jerusalem. Notice the article says quietly because if the Muslims were really to understand what is going on with the infrastructure and the purposes of it, I have no doubts that it would cause war between Israel and the Arab. So the government of Israel, they're producing these mass trains, high-speed trains to move pilgrims and Jews to go up to an area which they cannot go up to right now. But they are making the plans in the background to do just that. And that's why this article says quietly being constructed. If the Israeli government just came out and told everybody what they're doing concerning moving Jews to the Temple Mount, massive amounts of people and Jews to the area that is currently closed off to the Jews, it would cause instant war between Israel and the Arabs, the Muslims. It says the Third Temple will require a functional infrastructure that could facilitate the transportation of millions of Jews to Jerusalem during and after these festivals. Israel's Minister of Transportation, 
Yisrael Katz, has publicly stated that facilitating this was his intention when planning the line of the fast train currently under construction between the airport in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. In a meeting with Temple Movement representatives in February, the minister explained, as a Kohen, Jew of the priestly caste, I have a special connection to the holy site. In front of my eyes, I constantly see the words, prepare the way, prepare the way. So you have Israel's Minister of Transportation, Mr. Katz, who is also a Kohen, Jew of the priestly caste, saying he wants to prepare the way, prepare the way. Where else have we heard this before? It looks like he took it right out of Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 40, verse 3. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway of our God. So the train is associated with moving Jews to the Temple Mount area for one purpose and one purpose only. The temple is a significant sign that will usher in, they believe, their Messiah. So there's a lot of significance in the articles that you're reading that are coming from people inside the government. So what is Katz planning? Look at the rest of this article. Katz is planning on extending the line of the fast train to transport people from Ben Gurion Airport to Tel Aviv in Jerusalem directly to the Western Wall. And what's at the Western Wall? It's the Temple Mount area right above it. The final stop will be the Kotel Har Haibayat stop, Western Wall Temple Mount stop. I said the road is being paved. I should have said the railroad is being paved for this building of the Temple Mount. Here's the bottom line. The Israeli government, people in that government, are preparing to move these massive numbers to a temple that's not even built yet. So you would have to conclude, if they're gonna spend millions upon millions of dollars on the infrastructure to transport large numbers of people, you would have to assume that the agenda is rebuilding of that third temple. And all that's taking place is they're fulfilling exactly what Daniel said and what Jesus Christ warned us about this third temple and the Antichrist coming when that temple stands. So I'm going to continue to finish off this article. It says, we expect millions of Jews coming to the Temple Mount even before the temple is built. So transportation is a potential bottleneck, Haman explained to Breaking Israel News. We need to open up more entrances to the Temple Mount since there is currently only one entrance available to the Jews. Now in this article you're going to find out that Israel isn't going to just rely on a fast train to move these Jews that are coming from all over the world to go and pray and worship on the Temple Mount at the temple that's going to be rebuilt. Take a look at the rest of this article. In a similar vein, Jerusalem Mayor Nair Barkett has recently announced plans to build a cable car system that will be capable of transporting thousands of people per hour to the area of the Western Wall and guess what? And Temple Mount. The Israeli government ministers just recently approved this plan during a cabinet meeting held inside the Western Wall Tunnel. So again, Israeli officials planning for the day when that third temple is built. So the article talks about the trains. It talks about the cable cars. What else? The stated purpose of all of these plans is to modernize the capital city making it easier for both residents and tourists to navigate its increasing traffic. But it is abundantly clear that all of these upgrades will soon be used for the purpose of allowing millions of Jews from around the globe to quickly and easily visit the temple and to fulfill their biblical obligation. We need to establish express service bus transportation to the Temple Mount from all parts of the country, Heyman said. The Temple Mount Express bus lines will have special blue and white bus stops enabling Jews to regularly travel 
directly to the Temple Mount, pray and return home. So I don't care what is going on the Temple Mount right now, as of August the 6th of 2017, in relation to the riots, the violence caused by the Muslims on that Temple Mount area. Things in the very near future are going to totally change. The Israeli government is preparing for it in the background quietly, and Jesus told us it's coming. All they're doing is fulfilling his words. So let's continue on with the article. What we are seeing is to prepare the way for Jews to go up to the Temple Mount, Haman said. When the temple is built, the changes will be even greater. One of the principles of the final redemption is that it will come about through a series of processes that will seem to most to be no more than natural evolution. For those that have a better understanding and knowledge of these processes, it is clear that in order to accommodate the masses that will need to come to Jerusalem three times a year, a massive upgrade to the current Jerusalem infrastructure is required. This is a fact. If the Islamic leaders were so intelligent and they picked up on exactly what Israel's plans are and what they're actually doing, preparing for the Jews to go up to the Temple Mount, this would be an act of war, a takeover of the Temple Mount, or even sharing it for that matter, to the Muslim leaders is an act of war. But it isn't if the Temple will be built, it's when. Well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about for a declaration of war. This is from the Jerusalem Post. It came out October the 30th of 2014. Abbas closing off the Temple Mount tenement to declaration of war. This is Ahmad Abbas, the president of the Palestinian organization. Palestinian Authority President Ahmad Abbas called the closure of the Temple Mount to all visitors on Thursday, a declaration of war as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called for calm and civility in Jerusalem following the attempted assassination of Yehuda Glick Wednesday night. The PA chief pinned the blame for the dangerous escalation in violence on the Israeli government, saying the peak was this morning when the Jerusalem leadership decided to close the holy site to all visitors. So as I said, any tampering with this holy site at the Temple Mount for the Muslims is huge problems, not only for Israel, but for the world. Now what I found interesting about this article, you'll see here that Yehuda Glick, he was, as it says, his life was in jeopardy because he was shot five times by an assassin. He didn't die. Yehuda Glick just happens to be one of the head people for the Temple Mount Institute who was pushing for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple and full access for the Jews to be able to pray on the Temple Mount. And since October the 30th of 2014, after that assassination, guess who was elected to the Israeli Knesset? Yehuda Glick was elected and he is one of the Israeli officials who continues to push for the temple to be rebuilt. God is in control. The temple will be rebuilt, as I said, over and over again, just like the prophecies tell us. The question is, would you believe it? Now, earlier in my presentation, I told you that the Israeli government was spending massive amounts of money for the transportation for getting those Jews to the Temple Mount and any visitors for that matter. And as time goes by, Israel is going to put its hold on the Muslims so that the Jews can have that full access. Here's an article that just came out June 7th of 2017. Israel approves plans to tighten grip on East Jerusalem. Well, if you know anything about East Jerusalem, you know that that's where the Temple Mount is. It says Palestinian leaders have denounced new construction projects they say will further tighten Israel's grips on the occupied East Jerusalem 
in its holy places, including the incendiary site of al Mosque, and that would be where the Dome of the Rock is. The most elaborate plan is for a cable car intended to bring thousands of visitors an hour to the Western Wall in its Jewish prayer plaza immediately below al Harm al-Sharif, a compound containing al Ask and the golden top Dome of the Rock. Now take a look at this. It says the $56 million project was unveiled at a meeting of the Israeli cabinet in tunnels below the El Haram El Sharif. It is the first time the cabinet has met in Jerusalem's old city, which Israel annexed in violation of the international law. Now this is what the Islamic people are saying, that Israel's in violation of the law. But Israel owns this land and they're in violation of nothing. Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called the meeting in the provocative location late last month to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Israel's illegal occupation of East Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, it's not illegal at all. Israel was attacked by these Arabs and Israel won the war. Israel retook what was theirs in the first place. And they were celebrating the recapture of Jerusalem. And this, my friends, was also a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Palestinians, meanwhile, have expressed mounting concern that Netanyahu's stated intention to strengthen Jerusalem conceals a policy of driving out Palestinians and seizing control over the al as compound. Israel claims two ancient Jewish temples are built under the mosque. Israel is sending a message to the Palestinians and to Jordan, whose officials formally oversee the site that al as is no longer yours. We can enter and we can do as we please there. And this is what I've been talking about for years. The Muslims are afraid of a takeover. And by the amount of money and the preparations that the Israeli government is doing behind the scenes, I would say that it is a good possibility that's exactly what we will see in the very near future. At the weekend, Jibril Jaboub, a senior official in the Palestinian Authority, told the Israeli TV that Netanyahu's government had to stop treating the site as though it were under Israeli sovereignty. If you want to create an explosion, just say it's ours, it's ours, he said. And of course, the explosion that he's talking about, obviously, would be another huge conflict between Israel and the Arabs, the Muslims. I already showed you how the Israelis are proving plans to actually tighten the grips on East Jerusalem. I also told you earlier in this video that the Jews were not allowed to go up to the Temple Mount area to pray. Well, in a few years, things have already begun to change. And it does appear that the Israeli government is starting to put their feet down and make way for this future influx of Jews to go up and pray at the Temple Mount. So number one, I warned you about this article from the 7th of June 2017. I told you that I placed this article July the 12th of 2017. Two days after I put the information in this production let me show you what happened because it addresses this article and it also addresses the warning that I gave about Israel clamping down on the Muslims to eventually allow them to have full access to the Temple Mount and control it the way they used to. Well, things have transpired to actually force Israel to tighten its grip on this burdensome stone area, the Temple Mount. Look at this article that came out July the 14th. We need to close the Temple Mount to Muslims. And the reason why is because there was an attack by terrorists right there on the Temple Mount. And as a result, the deputy defense minister wants to close off completely this area, the Temple Mount, to Muslims, which would definitely infuriate them. Listen to this. 
Deputy Defense Minister Rabbi Ella Ben Dehan responded on Friday morning to the shooting attack at the Old City's Lion Gate in Jerusalem. The Cave of the Patriarchs, the Temple Mount, and Shishem Nebulus are the three places the Bible tells us were bought at full price in Israel. Ben Dehan said, These are the three places where no one can question the Jewish nation's ownership. We see that in the past week, Palestinians have made great efforts to undermine the Jewish nation's connection to these places specifically. It started with UNESCO's decision that the Cave of Patriarchs is a Palestinian heritage site, and it continued today with the three terrorists who carried out an attack immediately after leaving the Temple Mount. Israel must fight this effort by, now get this, strengthening its rule and hold on these areas, and must ensure that every Jew can pray in these places safely and without fear. The police did well by closing off the Temple Mount, and it should remain closed until we are certain that the area will be quiet and secure. Jerusalem Deputy Mayor Dov Kalmanovich warned that the shooting attack from the direction of the Temple Mount shows that the terrorists have crossed an additional red line, and it shows the weapons have trickled from Shem neighborhoods in Jerusalem's Arab areas. The current lack of sovereignty in the areas surrounding Jerusalem, the fact that police refrain from entering the Arab neighborhoods, and the weapons confiscations have all caused this bitter and unfortunate event. We need to close the Temple Mount to Muslims for an extended period of time and to tighten our security and diplomatic control of it. The Temple Mount is in our hands, should not be a slogan. It needs to be a clear fact on the ground. So there you go. If Israel needed any excuse at all, they now have it to force what they've been doing quietly in the background, getting ready to take over the Temple Mount and to begin funneling the Jews and tourists right there on the Temple Mount to carry out their faith on the Temple Mount area, which they haven't been able to do. The breaking Israel news that came out October the 26th of 2016 gives us information about what's happening at the Temple Mount. The headline reads, for the first time ever, Jews allowed to pray on Temple Mount as thousands ascend for holidays. So they're already starting. They're going to need these cable cars. They're going to need the rail systems and the buses. In a not-so-subtitle response to the recent UNESCO resolutions denying all connection between Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Record-breaking numbers of Jews ascended to the Temple Mount over the three-week holiday period encompassing Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. And in an incredible reversal of the usual status quo, some were even allowed to pray there. Hararetz reported, while the number of non-Muslim visitors permitted on the Temple Mount is usually restricted, a relatively quiet holiday season allowed for record numbers of Jewish visitors to ascend and marking a small but significant shift in enforced policy to discreetly pray at the site, which is considered the holiest in Judaism. All told, over 3,000 Jews, many of them religious, visited the temple over the holiday period. I would recommend that any Christian who loves the Lord keep your eyes on what's going on in Israel, in East Jerusalem, and on the Temple Mount area, because you're going to see a lot of activity concerning the Jews making headway, allowing their people to go up and have the rights, just like the Muslims do right now. The steps we're seeing taken by the Israeli government are forging the way for the appearance of the Antichrist. For years I've been warning you what is going to take place on the Temple Mount to cause the Jews to be able to go up and pray. 
And prior to making this seminar, I stopped in Pastor Dwayne's office to show him some of the warnings that I gave in the past and what has transpired today to fulfill the warnings. Take a look at this article. Jews pray on Temple Mount as Islamic Waf. Arabs boycott holy site over metal detectors. And here's what we have in a nutshell. We had on the Temple Mount area two police officers that were killed by terrorists on the Temple Mount. And President Benjamin Netanyahu closed the Temple Mount down to Jews and Muslims. What he did, he opened it up again on Sunday. But now, on Sunday, he installed metal detectors for anybody that was going through. And as a result, the WAC, who run the Temple Mount, boycotted the Temple Mount because of those metal detectors. And as a result, the Jews were able to go up and actually pray on the Temple Mount. It's the first time since 1999 they were not escorted up there by any of the Muslims who were running it. They had free access. Gets even better. The article says this, the WAF, Jordanian Islamic Authority, immediately called on the Muslims to boycott the site, calling the metal detectors Israeli aggression. Inter-Islamic scuffles broke out as some Palestinians attempted to prevent others from entering the Temple Mount compound. Dozens of Muslims prayed at the entrances to the compound, kneeling in prayer toward the IDF guards in a scene that seemed to be the sudden materialization of prophecy. And they quote a prophecy. And the sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call the city of Hashem, the Tazayan of the Holy One, Yisrael. And it's Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14. And then here's the picture of the idea of their soldiers, the Muslims, praying, bowing down before the Israelis' feet. And one of my last warnings, previous to this teaching class on August the 6th, 2017, I said, you will see the third temple built, but it's going to go step by step. And here we go, literally, we see that taking place in this report. Getting ready to fulfill completely this prophecy about the third temple. Now we show you the route that the Israelis have planned for their cable cars to go over to the Temple Mount area. And you'll see the route follows right here. You get off the Dung Gate and you walk through and you go right up to where the Dome of the Rock is, soon to be the Jewish Temple. These are the plans that were approved by the Israeli government. So in the future, as you see in this picture, thousands will flock to the Western Wall make their way up to the Temple Mount for the traditional priestly blessings. Only it won't be at the Temple Wall, it will be at the Temple. We are definitely in the last days and the prophecies are speeding up. Well, now that you know what the government of Israel is doing behind the scenes to prepare the way for the transporting of millions of people to this new temple, People like the Temple Mount Institute in Israel have been preparing for a very long time because they know the time of the Messiah is foretold in the scriptures. And so let me show you some of the things, what they've been doing to prepare for that day when they begin the real sacrifices and services there on the Temple Mount in the built third temple. I think it's a good idea that you see some of the things that have already been done for the preparation of that third temple and their services. Let me show you this article that came out March 31st of 2015 from the Times of Israel. Passover sacrifice reenacted by Jewish priests in training. And they give you a picture here of them carrying the animals that they're going to sacrifice. The Temple Mount Institute have announced that they have a school to train Levitical priests. Why? For the actual services that they believe will be done in the very near future. We haven't seen priests like this for almost 2,000 years, and it's not by coincidence they're here again in our generation. Now, in the Old Testament, they had a host of sacred vessels and vestments, 
And over these many years, since 1948, the Temple Mount Institute has recreated every single one of those vessels and vestments that were used in the sacrifices 2,000 years ago. And they have made them identically to like they were 2,000 years ago. Now the Temple Mount Institute wanted to begin practicing the slaughter of these animals for the atonement of their sins like they did 2,000 years ago. They ran into a problem with animals rights and as you can see from this article that came out in Jerusalem it says judge rules Pascal sacrifice practice proper appeal filed as you can see from this article that came out April 1st of 2015 the Temple Mount Institute won their case they won the appeal and you can see from the headline Temple Mount activists slaughter lamb in public rehearsal of Passover sacrifice so the Lord is removing the obstacles so that the prophecies can be fulfilled and there's no question it would have to be resolved because the Bible tells us they're going to start up the sacrifices one of the last things that the Temple Mount Institute needed for these temple services was a red heifer a pure red heifer which we haven't seen since the time that they were sacrificing during the time that Jesus Christ was alive and when you look in the book of Numbers chapter 19 you'll see that they needed a pure red heifer without spot in order for these sacrifices and as you see under the blue it says and one shall burn the heifer in his sight her skin and her flesh and her blood and her dung shall he burn and the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet cast it in the midst of the burning of the heifer so they needed this heifer and guess what when all of these signs are taking place in the last days red heifer shows up we're going back to breaking israel news this is september the 5th the 2018 this is today's news harbinger to messiah red heifer is born again this is the picture of the specific cow this heifer it cannot have any blemishes just like it was described in that 19th chapter of the book of numbers last tuesday the temple institute red heifer program was blessed with results an entirely red female calf was born paying the way for now get this re-establishing the temple service and marking the final stage of redemption Almost three years ago, the Temple Institute inaugurated its Raise a Red Heifer in Israel program. Due to laws restricting the importation of live cattle into Israel, the Temple Institute imported frozen embryos of Red Angus, implanting them in Israeli domestic cows. The pregnant cows were raised on cattle ranches in different locations throughout the country. The cows are giving birth this summer with several calves already having been born. One week after it's born, the newborn red heifer was certified, get this because this is important, was certified by a board of rabbis as fulfilling all the biblical requirements. Now, knowing what Jesus Christ showed us about what was going to happen in the future, you can count on the red heifer being established. Now that was the news back in September, September the 5th. Three months have passed since I gave you that information in that video that I made back in September. Take a look at this because I'm going to use this article to show you what's happened since. This is big time news. In the Mirror article, the headline, The Three Signs That Biblical Prophecies About End of the World and the Messiah Are Coming True. I'm only going to focus right now on the red heifer because this is the one that is the most important when we're talking about the rebuilding of the temple and starting up the temple sacrifices just as Jesus Christ warned in the Bible. There is a video of this red heifer. I'm going to just play the video for you right now. I'm going to stop it right here and read this so that you really can get the close view of what's taking place. On the 17th day of the month of Elu, 
5778, August the 28th of 2018, a perfectly red heifer was born in the land of Israel. A red heifer candidate is being raised and specifically cared for under the auspices of the Temple Institute Raise a Red Heifer in Israel program. The red heifer brings the promise of reinstating biblical purity to the world and the rebuilding of the holy temple. Now I'm going to go and read what the article has to say because this is extremely important for everyone. And keep in mind, these rabbis have been inspecting continuously the red heifer to make sure there's not one hair that was a different color other than red. It had to be exactly as the Old Testament heifers were. This is incredible because no one has seen a complete pure red heifer for thousands of years. But take a look at this, friends. After extensive examination of the calf, rabbinical experts are said to have confirmed, get that? Confirmed she is a viable candidate for biblical red heifer. Breaking Israel News reported a board of rabbis verifies she fulfilled the requirements of prophecy, which says the cow must be without blemish. So since September, as these rabbis have been watching this red heifer very, very closely, it is now confirmed that this is a pure red heifer. On March 4th of 2019, my Jewish friend who lives in Tiberias, Zeb Berg, wrote an email to me concerning the red heifer. Zeb wrote, I just called the Temple Institute. They said that they don't give out too much information, location, etc. because of fear of theft. Also, they don't want the public to know the location because that would bring thousands of tourists and noise that would upset the cow and may cause it to lose its totally red hair. So as of March 4th, the heifer that was born in August is still a pure red heifer. In the video you're looking at is the video that was sent from the Temple Mount Institute. This is a herd of red heifers that are carrying other candidates for the services in the future temple. After I received the email from Zed Berg on March 4th of 2019 concerning the red heifer, Breaking Israel News, March 6th, 2019, had an article entitled, Eminent Return of the Red Heifer, Fact or Fiction. And I'm going to scroll down to give you the meat of the report because essentially it confirms what Zed told me in his email. We'll start right here. Ariel told Breaking Israel News that there are two calves that may potentially be used in for the preparation of the ashes. They are currently being raised in an undisclosed location under special conditions. Care must be taken that they are not scared or blemished and they must remain separated from the bulls. So, so at least we know that the information that was handed down from Israel is in fact accurate information. Now another very important event took place in 2005. And you can see this article that came out from the Al Jazeera. Sanhedrin launched in Tiberias. What you have here is the religious bodies, except the religious men that have now formed the Sanhedrin. Keep in mind it was the Sanhedrin that Jesus Christ stood before in this unlegal court when they brought him to the Sanhedrin at night to try him. And we haven't seen the Sanhedrin for almost 2,000 years like we haven't seen the priests. But yet here we go again. The Sanhedrin is established. Why? getting ready to fulfill prophecy. Well, here's another major event that was reported about on August the 29th of 2016, breaking Israel news. 
high priest is chosen by Sanhedrin. Temple service could be one week away. Just like the priest, just like the Sanhedrin, we haven't seen a high priest since Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin almost 2,000 years ago. Do you think it's a coincidence that the priest, the Sanhedrin, and now a high priest has been reestablished? It's not a coincidence. The high priest along with the priest and the Sanhedrin are getting ready for those sacrifices of which the Antichrist is going to stop. I'm praying that you're noticing step by step how we're marching right to the fulfillment of these prophecies concerning Jerusalem and this Temple Mount. One of the last things to be recreated was the altar. The Heritage News of December 11th, 2018 reported Temple Mount activists celebrate new altar but plea to practice animal sacrifices rejected. So these priests wanted to do this sacrifice on the Temple Mount, but they were rejected because they don't have the full access to the Temple Mount yet. Activists who hope to see the temple rebuilt on Jerusalem's Temple Mount unveiled a new altar Monday they say is intended to be placed on the mount and used to offer sacrifices. For the past decade, these activists who are preparing for a rebuilt temple by recreating some of the ancient tools used in temple rituals have been practicing offering sacrifices in the days before Passover. So at this point, everything is set in place, except the Israeli government hasn't stepped in yet to take over the mount fully, but that day is approaching. Now we're coming to a close, but this is really important. When you keep in mind what the Lord showed us in Daniel, as we covered this before, but let me refresh your mind. And it says, He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, the Jews have to have a temple in order to do the sacrifices. And once that temple is established and the Antichrist goes into that temple, and he's going to stop the sacrifices from taking place. So, it shouldn't come to anyone's surprise who knows what the prophecy states that when they're watching the news, they're actually seeing now these new priests who are practicing sacrificing these lambs for the real services that will be done on the Temple Mount. Now, most of the Christians that I talk to don't even realize that the priests who've been established are actually practicing these sacrifices. And we're only one step away from the real thing. So let me just demonstrate through videos over the years how they've been practicing and each year getting closer and closer to the Temple Mount area where they know that they will be doing the real sacrifices right there on the altar at the Temple Mount with the new temple standing. Watch this. I'm going to start off with the year 2012, the first year where they actually did the first rehearsal where they killed the lamb in preparation for what's to come in the future when they really sacrifice in the temple. Bezat Hashem, on Erev Pesach, on Friday afternoon, we'll be doing this in the Azara. Kabbalah on Yisrael. It's the uh, first time in 2,000 years, practicing for now, but it, Bezat Hashem soon will be for real. We see this crowd of hundreds and hundreds of people from all over who came today to see this event. Actually, this should be a normal event. This is the basic command of the Torah for every Jew on Pesach, on the holiday of Passover, we have to bring our Passover offering. Unfortunately today, we cannot do it on the Temple Mount because of, of the various different political reasons, but the very fact that we are here, we are saying to, to God, we are saying to you Hashem, here we are, we are ready. If it's in our hands, we are ready to worship you as free people, as the holiday of Pesach is the holiday of freedom. We are here as free people, ready to say, here we are, we are ready. We hope that in the next few years, we will be able to already do it the way it should be done in the temple on the Temple Mount. 
The Temple Institute was founded on the principle of doing everything within our power towards the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. This year, the Temple Institute took a giant step towards making this goal a reality, a practice Passover offering, including all the stages of the service. This was not an actual Passover offering, which can only be done on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, but a drill for the purpose of increasing Israel's knowledge and preparedness for the actual bringing of the offering the moment this becomes possible. The Kohanim, descendants of Aaron and members of Israel's priesthood who participated in this event, are members of the Temple Institute's Nezer HaKodesh Academy for Priests in Training. The Torah states, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they shall take for themselves, each man, a lamb or kid for each father's house. It shall be yours for examination until the fourteenth day of this month. The entire assembly of Israel shall slaughter it in the afternoon. The Mishnah describes the steps of the Passover offering. The entire nation of Israel converges on the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Many thousands of offerings are brought within a short period of time. The Kohanim need to be expert, sensitive, and focused. The words, next year in rebuilt Jerusalem, are recited every year at the conclusion of the Passover Seder. When I see events like this, I reflect back to how the apostles must have felt when they saw the prophecies from the Old Testament being fulfilled. They saw John the Baptist preparing the way, and then the Messiah coming and his ministry for three years, watching him rise the dead, healing the sick, then dying himself, and just as he promised, resurrecting on the third day. We in our generation are seeing the last prophecies beginning to be fulfilled. So in a way, we're much like those earlier apostles who saw those prophecies fulfilled. These are signs. This is the last generation that Jesus warned about. Now that you have all the information about this coming third temple, I think it's a good idea that we walk inside the temple so that you can see what the inside of this temple will look like and then walk outside of the temple so you can see what the surrounding area from this rebuilt third temple will also look like. And we're provided this type of view by the JewishPress.com that came out August the 1st of 2017. They put up an article entitled Explore the Temple on Google Maps Street View. Since Jesus did give us the warning about this third temple, and considering everything that's happening in East Jerusalem today surrounding the sovereignty of East Jerusalem in this Temple Mount, I think it's a really good idea that you know everything that you can know about this coming third temple including 
exactly what it will look like when it is built. But just before we do go in, I wanted to point something out because it needs to be pointed out. You may not know what it is. That illustrated picture that you just saw, this is a picture of this altar of burnt offering which I showed you previously. And you could see that in Exodus chapter 40, verse 29. And you get a better picture of the ramp going up where they would actually do this burnt offering. And that's what this is for. Now that you have the information about the Temple Mount Institute and how they created this ramp for the coming sacrifices, let's move on from here and continue on. We're right at the platform outside the Holy of Holies, which I'll show you, but this is like the courtyard outside of that area. And I'll just turn it around so you can see what that looks like. And this is, again, where the Antichrist will be going. Now you see these huge doors that are just before the Holy of Holies there at this third temple that they're showing us. So let's go right into the Holy of Holies so I can show you what that's going to look like. We're inside. I'm going to show you the ceiling view of it so you can see exactly what they show us. And I'll bring it down to a floor view and do the same thing. So let's move out of this Holy of Holies. We'll go up the stairs here. And we're back where the altar of burnt offering is. Just giving you a glimpse of what it looks like. And so what I did is went through this passageway here, and this is obviously outside where the temple itself is. So you get a good view of what's going to be coming soon in Israel on the Temple Mount area. That's why there's been so much activity in East Jerusalem right now amongst the Jews and the people that follow Islam. You've seen in the news in the last couple of weeks the Arab Palestinians who have caused all kinds of problems there in the Temple Mount. And there's the temple itself as we were already in it. So you get a good view of things to come. Now for anybody who doesn't believe that this is actually ever going to happen, all I'm going to say is just stay tuned. Because when you see it take place, when you see the structure of these buildings going up, you'll understand the words of the Lord Jesus Christ should be taken seriously. Because that will tell us that the Antichrist is already alive and he's just about to take his position in prophecy to fulfill every word that Jesus spoke about him and this third temple. Knowing all these facts, knowing what Jesus Christ has given to us before these events actually took place, it should encourage you to want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Romans 9.28 it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. If you ask Jesus Christ today, right now, Lord, please be my Savior. I believe 
in your word. I believe in your prophecies. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again on the third day just as you promised and prophesied. And now I believe without a doubt you're in heaven and you will come back soon for all those who have received your blessing and the blood that you shed for us on your cross. Today, please, Lord, put my name in your book of life as today I begin to live my new life for you. Thank you, Jesus, so much for going to the cross for me and all those who would have your salvation.